So this is, this is one of those uh, ones I'm going to do disclaimers for because I, I really don't want to be misunderstood when, I, when I'm... Does anybody know what cryptozoology is? Never heard of it? Uh, it's the study of mythical or legendary creatures, right? Bigfoot, the Yeti, Loch Ness Monster. Here's my, here's my disclaimer. I don't believe any of those exist, okay? Just before I get going, I do not believe there's a Bigfoot out there. I don't believe there's a Loch Ness Monster. I don't believe that. But let me, let me put it to you this way. If someone were to ask me, is it possible that Bigfoot could exist? My answer to that question is yes. I'll give you two examples of this. You ever seen, uh, just to sw switch gears, you ever seen there's an old woodcut that they'll throw up on when they're talking about some sort of sea monsters? Once again, sea monsters don't exist. But it's like of an old ship, and then there's like an octopus underneath it with its tentacles kind of reaching around the ship, right? Um, 1925, they discovered uh, something called the Colossal Squid. I love the names, right? It's the squid, the giant squid, the colossal squid. The next one will be the super hot dog, a number one squid, and then they go on and on. Uh, colossal squid, uh, real creature. Uh, southern seas, hangs out way below the waves. Let me throw a possibility to you. So <clears throat> when this woodcut was cut, the largest ships that the Europeans were using were called caravals. It's the same uh, ship that uh, Columbus, the Nina, the Pinto, the Santa Maria, they were these ships. They're about only 55 feet long, which is terrifying to cross the Atlantic in ships that small. The colossal squid, the big ones, are about 44 feet long from the top of the mantle to the end of their tentacles. Here's a, for instance, for you. Um, these things hate sperm whales and vice versa. And sperm whales that have gone, like, washed up on the beach dead, will have these sucker marks and hook marks on their backs. Nobody knew what they were. And it's fighting with these colossal squids, which the sperm whales love to eat. What if a sperm whale dragged one of these things up during a fight to the surface? And then men, sailors, in a caravel looked over the side and saw this thing beside their ship because they were hunting the whales. Then they would go back to shore, get drunk, and tell everybody, we saw this thing we've never seen before, and it was the size of the ship. And everybody go, ah, come on. There's no such thing as sea monsters. <coughs> Bigfoot, why, if somebody asked me, could Bigfoot be real? I say yes. Back in 1935 in Indonesia, they discovered the bones of a primate they'd never seen before, and once they did the estimates of its size, tell me if this sounds familiar, it would stand, would have stood, it was 300,000 years ago, would have stood nine feet tall with reddish brown hair, huge. Now, if that was standing upright to grab something off a tree, what would that look like? Bigfoot. Once again, don't clip this online and say, I'm saying Bigfoot's real. Bigfoot is not real. We would have discovered one walking around. There's millions of us in North America, right? Could it exist. It did exist. Sea monsters, depending on what you call them, whales, colossal squids, did exist. Loch Ness Monster looks an awful lot like a plesiosaur. There's no plesiosaurs on the planet today, but could something like that exist? It did exist. There's an interesting kind of disconnect between what we see and what we think we see. And I'm going to go back one reading from today's Gospel to Matthew 8, 22. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village, and when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, <clears throat> Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And then he sent him away to his home and said, do not even go into the village. Here's a question. Is, like, sometimes when Jesus is tired or having an off day, his healing isn't complete? No. So what's going on? Did he not heal the blind man the first shot? He had to have two tries to get it right? No. The blind man saw perfectly the first time. 
Why did he think he saw trees walking around? Because he had felt trees, and he didn't know what he was looking at. He saw, but he didn't understand what he saw. The second time Jesus stares at him, and all of a sudden he realizes that they're people, is he puts into his mind the knowledge exactly of what he's looking at. He could see, but he didn't yet understand. And the same thing is going on here when we have this odd, seemingly Jesus once again is having an off day. Peter takes him aside after he tells him that the Messiah has to be taken, killed, three days again, uh, three days afterwards to rise again. Peter doesn't want to see his friend and his teacher killed. So he takes Jesus aside and says, you can forbid this, don't allow this to happen. And then Jesus rebukes him in turn. Get behind me, Satan. That's kind of harsh. I don't know if a friend has ever said that to you. No one's ever said that to me. I think I would take that pretty hard. Get behind me, Satan. Peter and the others knew intellectually, in their minds, that he was the Messiah. They'd come to the realization, but they didn't yet understand what that meant. The grace of Jesus Christ had not been sent into their hearts to fully understand the impact of what was being spoken about here. In, uh, we actually read this in morning prayer last week. Uh, the letter from James begins with, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strict strictness. If you're going to teach the gospel, one thing that you need to make absolutely clear, two things. One, you have to know yourself. And you have to know, like a camera, if you're putting filters on that thing. Have you interpreted the gospel? You think Paul or James or John was having an off day? It was a long time ago. Here's what he meant to say. I'll stop you right there and say, you're on the wrong track. The Bible is not there for us to agree or disagree with. It's there for us to wrestle with. I've known people who've memorized passages from the Bible not to gain God's wisdom, but to get at Christians and in their argumentation. That's a person like the blind man from Aseda who can see, but doesn't understand what they're looking at. They're looking at trees walking around. And for us, we have to understand what we're looking at. Is it a sea monster? Or is it something that we would later call a colossal squid? <laughs> Is it a tree walking around, or is it a human being? Is this what Scripture is telling me to do, or is this my spin put on it based upon all my biases? We talk today as if certain groups have more or less biases than anyone else. If you've lived your life for longer than five years, you have biases. There's foods you don't like, and there's foods that you like. There's movies you like, there's movies you hate. You ever been to a comedy movie that is just atrocious, but the person next to you is laughing their head off? Do you know how annoying that is? <laughs> People laughing at garbage comedy, and you're like, what? Are you like, oh, it's hilarious. They got tears running down their face. We have untold, I'm not even going to put a number on it, untold filters that we look at the world through. This is where prayer is so critically important. To pray constantly, to read scripture constantly, and to pray for the grace to see it, not through our own lens, but to see it for the wisdom that God is attempting to convey to us. And not the wisdom that we're attempting to put on the scripture, to use for our own purposes, which is a constant danger to us. Constant. And no matter how long you live, 100 years, 105 years, it will continue to be as big a danger now and then as it will ever be. It never leaves. So today when we talk, we do, like this, this, this beautiful uh, passage of scripture from, from, uh, uh, from the wisdom of Solomon, speaking about the fact, and, and from Proverbs, wisdom cries out in the streets, in the square she raises her voice, at the busiest corner and cries out, why? Why this image of, of this personification of wisdom crying out in these busy places? Because wisdom is often not heard. 
But you've got to remember, God's wisdom is always it, it, right before us. And if we understand who Christ is and who we are in relation to Christ, then things stop becoming trees walking around and they become human beings. We need to pray constantly. I, sorry, I, one of my professors at school said, you, you've got to stop using have to, must, and should in, in my, and I try, I've tried. <laughs> I've tried to erase that from, from any, any time I preach, but I, I don't. I strongly encourage you. <laughs> when you pray, to pray to God to grant you the grace to see uh, Scripture, what it's telling you, not for what you believe it to be, but what God means it to be. Sometimes those are completely aligned with what you, you thought it was in the first place. Other times, it, it's not. And the important thing is, is that we don't stray away from or fearful of, and God forbid, erase that from our own personal canons because it doesn't align with the way you see the world. This is here to shape us. It is not here for us to shape in our own image. And please remember that.